Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. I'm the Ignorant Intellectual and this is the inter Ignorant Intellectual. It's a tongue twister, that's for sure. Ignorant Intellectual on Media. And this will be my second video. I have an introductory video if you want to know what uh, my channel is about and why I call myself that. Just um, move to the previous video and uh, you'll get all that information. This video is going to be my first uh, video on the media itself and today i thought i would do a collection that i picked up from a gentleman who was advertising his uh dvd collection blu-ray collection on uh facebook marketplace and i picked up a bunch of stuff from him so i actually over the last week or two because he keep continually put stuff up so i may even go back to him again depending on what he puts up but you know, you'll put up a, a certain amount of things and then, uh, you know, you'll get tired of, of, of listing stuff and so you'll stop, but you still have more stuff to put up, so you'll put up more stuff. And so, as he puts up more stuff, there's more stuff that I'm interested in. So, so what he originally put up was all of his DVDs and Blu-rays, you know, the more mainstream uh, DVDs and Blu-rays, not the, you know, box sets and, uh, and uh, boutique cinema type of type of items that he had in his collection so it was like between 500 and a thousand and he listed them alphabetically basically so like a to a to d or whatever he'll put up an ad and from e to so i went through all of them and i found now i have a very large collection of, of movies already so um what happens is when you first start collecting media like physical media like dvds or blu-rays or 4ks you start out with nothing right so and usually what you'll do is you'll pursue and, and, and pick up the things that you enjoyed watching already. And then after after you do that, you get the main movies in your collection that you enjoy watching. Um, you'll start, you know, branching out and start speculating, right? Or, or what I call speculating. I mean, you'll pick up a movie that you haven't seen, hope, hoping that you'll like it, right? So, and then after that, you'll end up expanding, expanding. And there's certain ways that you can do that. And, you know, in the... In the videos to come, we'll, we'll, we'll go over a bunch of different ways of those and uh, how you collect compared to, let's say, how I collect, uh, what you watch as compared to maybe uh, what I watch, that kind of thing. So, But today, I thought, okay, there's there's, you know, there's a few ways that you can collect, um, uh, you know, media, media, right? So you can buy it new from like a, a store that's in your neighborhood, maybe a Best Buy, maybe... You know, if it's a book, maybe you go to uh, Indigo or Chapters here in Canada. Um, Prospero uh, books, if they're even still around. Or you can go on Amazon and order order this stuff or go get it used off of eBay or other sites, right? Um, and um, Or you can actually travel around your city to the different thrift stores or, or go to, like, uh, you know, church basements that have, uh, you know, uh, sales on the weekend or uh, garage sales if, if People still do that. I do that occasionally. Um, or you can go online to the, you know, Kijiji, which is a big Facebook marketplace style, uh, you know, classified ad kind of kind of website that's here in Canada, or Facebook marketplace or eBay. So, so there's lots of places that you can find media, um, buying it new or buying it used. All right. So we're we're going to pursue all those different venues, and when I, whenever I end up picking things up to add to my collection. Well, if it's enough of it, we'll, we'll make a video about it and then we'll go over the films and, and see. Uh, it should be enjoyable. I like watching other people that do these style of videos where they pick stuff up and then they show you the actual physical media so that you, so when you're out searching around, you can see uh, maybe you'll come across a, 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 you know, a DVD or a Blu-ray that, that I show you and you go, okay, so that's what that looks like. And then when you go out on your own pursuits, you can you'll come across it easier because you'll be able to find it because you know what it looks like, right? Or you didn't know that this box set of, of one of your favorite directors or actors is out there, and then you start looking for that because you want to pick it up, right? So so it's always fun to see what other people's libraries and media collections look like because it gives you an idea of what's out there and what you can find yourself, all right? So so this, this gentleman, like I said, uh, that was selling his uh, library, I bought, um, the first time I went, I bought 18... Um, 16 Blu-rays, uh, sorry, 16 DVDs and two Blu-rays to add to my collection, all right? So then the second time I went, I picked up um, a box set, and 
Uh, third time I went, I picked up another box set. And then the fourth time I went, I picked up two more box sets. So all together was uh, one, two, three, four box sets. So all together, what I got off of the gentleman so far, he may be listing more stuff. But at the time of this video, I picked up 16 basically regular DVDs, two regular Blu-rays, and then four box sets. And I thought maybe I'd go through them and we can have some fun uh, uh, going over them. All right, so the first one, the uh, first one I'll do is, uh, I have a bunch of sticky notes here. So if you see me when I'm looking at you and then I look down at a sticky note, it's just, it's a lot of media. And um, with my 55 year old brain and being an ignorant intellectual as I am, sometimes I'll forget names or dates and things like that. So I like to write them down and I'll just quickly look at them and, and, and I'll know what, what, what a date is or whatever. I don't have to like, uh, rack my brain and it's kind of boring watching somebody doing this right so what was it what was it right so figure out write it down and then it'll be taken care of all right so the first one is the emperor and the princess okay sorry the emperor and the assassin now this is a chinese movie it came out in i think 2001 uh, but don't quote me on that uh in the 2000s and it, it um it's directed by chen kayaji if i'm saying that correct Okay, so I don't know much about Chen Kayachi. All I know is the reputation of this film is pretty good. So when I collect something, if I'm speculating, most of this most of this stuff I haven't seen. Okay, um, it's mostly speculation because you know I'm not in that stage of collecting where I'm collecting the stuff that I like. This, I have mostly everything that I like already, right? Uh, I'm I'm in the stage where I'm speculating and expanding my knowledge and expanding my. Uh, you know my library of films to watch and stuff so so this one is supposed to be pretty good it came out in the early 2000s directed by chen kayaji or kg k-a-i-g-e so here, here we go if i was uh if i was familiar with like with the gentleman or or maybe i took chinese cinema in university i might know how to pronounce that gentleman's name so how about you tell me how to pronounce it and uh, it'll be cool and i'll be able to use the pro proper name after this, right? But anyway, so this is one of his better films from my understanding. And um, on Reputation, this is, a, this is a great watch. So I decided to pick it up, all right? So Reputation, what I mean by that is word of mouth and, you know, reviews and things. Um, you know, go online, you re review newer movies or older movies, what people like and everything. Or you watch videos and somebody recommends this, saying that it's a really good film, all right? So just, you know, Reputation, you'll get a rep. Uh, Films will get a reputation over time on, on there being good, bad, or what's wrong with them, or what's good about them, and so on and so forth. And if, you know, if you're open to that uh, intellectual pursuit of, of learning, um, you'll, get, you'll get a reputation of a lot of movies that you haven't seen. So this, the reputation of this one is pretty good, so I thought I'd pick it up. Now, I don't collect this director. When I collect films, I usually collect by director. Um, maybe I'll go in, in, into that on, on how people collect in another video but i basically collect mostly by director or by a reputation of the film all right so um this isn't one of the collectors i direct so so it's like a uh, you know it's a shot in the dark let's see if this movie is any good and if it is i'll add it to my collection if it isn't i'll just resell it all right so so this film is supposed to be what is it about is it about uh china back in you know the turn of the first century um was uh, not the China that it is now. It was a whole bunch of individual kingdoms. I think there were seven of them, but don't quote me on it. It could be nine. But there was a bunch of, 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 of different kingdoms inside of what we call China now um, that were all broken up, you know, like warlords or, or kings had certain territories. And there was one guy, uh, I think it was in the Qi Dynasty, or sorry, the Qi, uh, the King of Qin, Q-I-N. So one of, uh, one of the uh, territories was called the it was called Kin, and he decided that he should he should uh, bring China all together under one rule, and of course it would be his rule, right? And this is what this is about: his ambition and his uh, abilities or whatever to try to you know uh, get China as uh, under one rule rather than seven or nine different kingdoms, right? And uh, it's supposed to be a pretty pretty good film, all right. So that's the first film, all right. The second film. Is Exodus, and this film is directed by Otto Preminger. All right, so Otto Preminger is a Hungarian guy, Austrian, Austri Austrian-Hungarian. 
Is that how you pronounce it? See, ignorant intellectual, Austro-Hungarian director. Where I came uh, around him and I collect him as a director is um, a collection I bought off a gentleman of, of early stuff. Stuff. Uh, he was a big fan of film noir, and he had a lot of film noir, and I'm a big fan of film noir, but my collection of film noir like paled in comparison to this gentleman's collection. And I got a huge amount, like over 200 uh, film noirs, plus like probably 1,800 other other uh, uh, movies off, off of this gentleman. And uh, Otto Preminger, after, once I went through it all, and, and I cataloged it all, or, or, or you know, put it, put it all in, in, in an organized manner. He had a large collection of Otto Preminger uh, movies, and I watched a few of them. And Otto Preminger was extremely good in the film noir, uh, you know, in film noir. He made, like, I know at least two, at least two seminal works in film noir um, that everybody should watch. Now, do you think I can uh, remember the names of them? I don't know. I wrote it down in one of these things. Um, Anyways, if I come across, yeah. So one of them is called Fallen Angel, and the other one is called Anatomy of a Murder. Um, now, I'm not sure if Anatomy of a Murder, I think that one came out in 57 or 59. I think that one is considered a film noir, but don't quote me on that. But I know that Fallen Angel from 1945 is one of the great film noirs. All right, so and uh, so I decided to collect Preminger, and I came across this film. All right, so this film isn't from the 40s and 50s. Actually, I think it's 1960 that this film came out. And it stars a younger Paul Newman, all right? And basically what this film is, uh, it surrounds the creation of Israel back in the 40s, all right? So basically in Egypt, Paul Newman is like a Jewish underground fighter of some sort. And he he's in, he's in a, I don't know if they're in, in like POWs or, or what they are. But they're in Egypt, all right? And he takes 600 Jews and escapes out of Egypt and gets on, on, on a ship. And they head towards Palestine because, you know, Israel hasn't been created yet. So the, the whole area is called Palestine. Now, during, during the 40s, Palestine was under, you know, the protectorate of, of, of the British Empire, of, of the English, right? So, so when, uh, when Paul Newman and his 600 other Jews go towards uh, Palestine, they're stopped by the British, and this is all about that, um, how they get around the British and get into Palestine and then start creating, you know, what we know as modern day Israel, all right? So, you know, politics aside, uh, whether uh, what the Jewish people did was right or or were they, you know, um, taking over land that wasn't theirs, but of course, was it theirs? Because historically speaking, they were from that land. All that, that's what this, this is about. But basically, it's kind of like an action film of Paul Newman and 600 other uh, Jewish people going to uh, Palestine to create Israel, right? Um, it's really, from my understanding, it has a good reputation. And Otto Preminger directed it, so it's probably going to be a pretty good film. And it stars Paul Newman, who's a great actor. So it has all the elements to be a great film. So once I watch this, I think I'll like it. And that's the number two film. Number three is Old Man in the Sea. Oh, uh, I'll do that one later. Because there's something I want to say about that. But, all right, so uh, the next one up is is Go, all right? And this one is directed by Doug Lyman. Now, Doug Lyman is a, is a favorite director of mine, uh, uh, mostly because of, see, this is where my brain kicks in. All right, so Doug Lyman did this one. This one is... is there's three different stories kind of meshing back and forth through each other, each other's storyline in this film. So it's, so it's kind of like a, a sophisticated type of film um, where there's a whole bunch of different things happening all at the same time. And, it, and it's supposed to be very, uh, very good. Um, Doug Lyman is the guy that directed The Born Identity, was one of the films that I really enjoyed by him. Uh, I'm assuming you've seen The Born Identity. If you haven't, it's a really good action film. All right. The whole trilogy, or the first three films, are all good, but the first one was extremely good, directed by Doug Lyman. He also did Mr. and Mrs. Smith, which was, I, I enjoy it, I like it, um, but most people kind of like, eh, it's okay, da 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 um, So, um, and he also did the big one, the one that I really liked. What was the name of that one? Um, it was called...
Um, Edge of Tomorrow, yes. The one, the one that I always forget because nobody knows exactly what the name of it is, right? So, so I, I call it the Edge of Tomorrow, and I think people are, most people adopted that uh, name for it, and that stars Tom Cruise, and he's like a, uh, a reporter. I think he's a reporter, or no, he's, he's a propagandist for the military, and he has a military. Uh, I think he's a colonel or a major, something like that, or a captain. Anyways. One, one, one of those designations, and he ends up getting recruited into into the war against the aliens that are invading Earth, right? And he ends up somehow getting into a time loop where he, he experiences the same thing over and over again. And the cool thing about the film is he manipulates that time loop to um, see if uh, he can actually defeat the aliens because the aliens are winning and it looks like Earth is going to be overrun, right? So, so it's a really interesting uh, idea. It has a similar... Uh, central structure that uh, remember that Bill Murray film uh, Groundhog Day where he kind of that's more of a comedy this one's more of an action but has that kind of idea where Bill Murray is kind of caught in a time loop um, well so was uh, Tom Cruise in this film and I really really enjoyed that film out of mainstream films that's, that's a favorite of mine and that came out in I think 2016 was it no 2014 came out 2014 and I think it was one of the 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 best films of that year coming out of Hollywood. All right. So, um, edge of tomorrow, if you haven't seen it. All right. So, uh, this film also stars Sarah Polly. And I'm not sure if you know Sarah Polly or whether you're Canadian or not, but, uh, if you're Canadian, you probably know who Sarah Polly is if you're into movies. All right. So Sarah Polly, um, is one of Canada's great treasures when it comes to actors and directors she directed a film called away from her about a older older uh, couple uh, one one of them has uh, alzheimer's and the other one you know is taking care of them even though the other person doesn't even remember them half the time and it's uh, it's really a touching film but where i came uh to her first was the remake of dawn of the dead i don't know back in 2000 do you remember that uh, film dawn of the dead where they're all stuck in a shopping center up on the roof of the shopping center. Bing Rames is in it as well, you know, the guy from Pulp Fiction um, and uh, other films. Um, I thought that was an extremely good film, and I'm a big fan of Sarah Pauly, so maybe I enjoyed it more than other people did. Uh, but I found that film great. And I kind of actually, you know, uh, like it better than the, than the, uh, than the original, um, which is kind of sacrilegious to say because when people speak of the greatest zombie films of all time, Dawn of the Dead is, is up there, like, if not the best, uh, like, up, up top five at least. And a lot of Romero films are, right? And the remakes usually don't stand up. But this remake, I don't know, I really enjoyed it. I don't know why. I kind of like the idea of the uh, the shopping center and, and, and um, it being in color rather than in black and white. Um, I enjoy black and white films, but if you have a choice between color and black and white, you know, color is usually better. I mean, unless you're trying to unless the director is trying to put off a certain feel, um, which some films do, like, let's say, uh, another film that I'll mention a bit later, which was called, uh, what was it called? Anyways, I'll remember it a bit later. Um, anyway, so I really enjoyed Sarah Pauly, so that's a, that's a bonus. So Doug Lyman as the director, Sarah Pauly is one of the main characters in this film, and the story is supposed to be pretty sophisticated and interesting to watch. Um, uh, so let's see if I like that one. Have you seen it? Do you think it's good? Uh, give me your opinion in, in, in the comments below saying, oh man, Scott, you, you, you should not watch that. Avoid that film. It's just really bad. Or, you know, nobody really ever recommends not to watch a film. Uh, they'll say, I didn't like it very much or, or, or so on and so forth. Or watch it and tell me what you think, that kind of idea. Um, but it, uh, other than uh, Doug Lyman and Sarah Pauly, I didn't hear a lot about this, the reputation of this film. I didn't hear a lot about it, so I'm not sure how good it is. Anyway, so next up is the original War of the Worlds. All right, so um, I did not have this in my collection, and it was sorely lacking. If you enjoy classic sci-fi, this film is one of them that you should have in your collection, correct? So I finally got it in my collection. I thought, so if we go back to the, the gentleman that had, um, like I bought about 2,000 films off of, um, he had a nice Blu-ray version of this film, the original film in Blu-ray. Um, 
but unfortunately when I opened it, out of all the boxes after I opened them, I uh, didn't have the disc inside. So I actually have the the Blu-ray case of, of this film, but I don't actually have the film itself until now, right? So so it's, it's you know, you, you sh shouldn't say you must have this film, but I mean, if you're collecting uh, classic sci-fi, this is one of the ones that you should have, right? And, uh, you know, it's great. I, I actually have watched this, but I watched this when I was a kid back back in the day, back in the, I think in, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s, when did this film come out? This film came out in 1953. And uh, I don't know if it was originally in black and white and then colorized. It could be that, right? So, but all I remember when I was a kid and I watched this film were the big spaceships with the big eye on the top and then you had that, you know, uh, that laser light that comes out of the eye and destroys everything. I thought that was really cool when I was a kid. Uh, thought, wow, well, that's pretty exciting. Imagine if... Uh, if we had that type of technology, I didn't think technology at the time, but imagine if, if we could fly around in spaceships, that would be awesome. Shoot these things, that'd be super cool, right? So, so, uh, so I finally have it in my collection, all right? So that's War of the Worlds. Um, next up is Eric the Viking. Now, Eric the Viking stars Tim Robbins, all right? But it has a lot of the cast members of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, Monty Python. And it's directed by Terry Jones, who's a, a, a director I collect, right? So, um, Monty Python is hilarious. They're, you know, Life of Brian, uh, The Meaning of Life. All, all, their, all their major motion pictures were all great. Um, my personal favorite is The Meaning of Life. I really like the restaurant scene with the very large man who eats a mint and then all hell breaks loose. Let's put it that way. I don't want to ruin it if you haven't seen that film, but see it if, if you haven't. And, uh, you know, the piano player in that movie scene. Uh, singing about all the different uh, words for his penis was really hilarious as well. So um, the whole film is hilarious. Anyway, so uh, so this one is kind of like, you, you know, you have uh, Terry Jones in it, you know, Tim Robbins, who, who plays a uh, um, a Viking, basically, and his name is Eric the, the Viking. Um, and he, you know, they they do the, the normal Viking things, going around pillaging, uh, and, and all that stuff, and he kind of gets bored of it. And I think he meets meets a girl, and then accidentally kills the girl. And then he he's off to the Norse gods to bring the Norse gods back in order to bring his his girlfriend back. At least I think that's what the main plot of the of the film is. I haven't seen it, so um, but that's my understanding of it. And it's supposed to be a, a pretty funny comedy. All right, so that's Eric the Viking. Next up is the Last Typhoon. Which is directed by Elia Kazan. Is that how you pronounce his name? Elia, E L I A, Kazan, K A Z A N. Again, the ignorant intellectual. Uh, Kazan was another guy that I came across when I bought the collection uh, from that gentleman because Kazan is, is, is a, and also a pretty uh, big name in the film noir uh, uh, genre, right? So um, this one came out in, I think, 77, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 77, um, and it stars at a young Robert De Niro, and it's it's about the movie industry back uh, back in the early days of the movie industry. He plays a a movie mogul, if I remember correctly, and it's based on off the F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, book of the same name, um, and it's supposed to be a pretty good drama. So, and if it's done by Kazan, see the the collection that I got off that gentleman, well, he was basically a fan early film, all right? I don't know if he was a student of early film. Maybe um, it, it, was a, it, it was a pleasurable pursuit for him. But he had a, uh, for lack of a better word, shitload of films from the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, and then it starts to dwindle down in the 1960s and the 1970s. But he had basically... Um, and some from the 80s and 90s and that, but basically the core was like from the 20s to the 60s. Everything, you know, all the the early horror things, um, you know, the stuff put out by Hammer in, 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 in the 50s and 60s, uh, all the old, old, uh, you know, the universal uh, films with all, you know, like The Wolfman and, and, and The Invisible Man and Dracula and all... You know, like 400 Criterion Collection films and a bunch from uh, Eureka, a bunch from uh, Indicator, a bunch from uh, the British Film Institute, a bunch from 
um, Arrow. I mean, his collection was a massive collection, and it was like height and collection. And so once I bought it, I now have almost a complete film noir collection. I have uh, almost a complete old, you know, classic sci-fi and classic horror collection now. And Kazan was one of the guys that he really liked. And he ended up buying this, all right? And this is a beautiful box set, all right? So this box set has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 16 of Kazan's films, all right? And all this film noir stuff, all this early stuff from the 40s and 50s, all the way up to 63. So basically an over, I mean, of most of Kazan's films, right? Now, one of them wasn't this one, all right? So um, that's kind of serendipitous. So uh, now I have like 17 Kazan films. And I'm going to watch this film noirs. Um, and uh, he's the guy, actually, I have seen some of his films because he's the guy that did a street car named Desire, which I've seen before, and uh, On the Waterfront, which I've also seen, and East of Eden, which is some another one I also seen. So he's a really big name in, in the 40s and 50s. Um, and look at how beautiful this set is. I I I, I put a uh, I replasticized it with with a, you know, with a cellophane bag to protect it. So um, and that's another video that I'm going to do about uh, how best to protect your media if, if you protect it. Right. So. All right, so so that's so when I got this, I went, wow, that's nice. And then I looked over the the films, and I'm going, wow, this director is extremely good. So when I came came along with uh, saw this film in the gentleman's collection, I picked it up. All right, so it's supposed to be a pretty good film as well. All right, so um, so it's called The Last Tycoon, and stars a young Robert De Niro. All right, so uh, next step after that is let's do this one, Superfly. All right, so Superfly is one of the big uh, black exploitation films. I I've been looking for this film forever, um, like at least a decade, and I finally found it. Um, unfortunately, so when this this uh, this film came out in '72, it's not his best film. He has another film. All right, uh, the guy I'm talking about is Gordon Parks Jr. He has another film. It's called Three the Hard Way, and that is one of the great all-time great uh, black exploitation films. This one is like, you know, no slouch or anything. But Three the Hard Way is probably his best film, with this one being his second best. Um, then he, he did another uh, black exploitation film that's kind of like a Western, that was called, what was that called? Um, see, Thomason and, and, and Bushrod. Uh, so three exploitation, black exploitation films, and then he did like a, a romance film. He only did four films, Gordon Parker Jr. He only did four films. The fourth one was uh, Aaron Loves Angela. It was a romantic comedy from 1975. All right, so see, I'm looking at my notes, right? Um, anyways, but this film and Three the Hard Way are the core of his um, great black exploitation films, and they're up there with all the all the great like Foxy Brown and all the, all the other uh, great uh, Shaft and all those other great um, black exploitation films. But this might be one of the few films where the the film is good for for what it is, right? It's really good in in its in its uh, genre, um, but the soundtrack outshines the actual film. And the soundtrack called Superfly came out in 1972 and it's done by Curtis Mayfield and that is one of the best R&B soul albums of all time. Um, and it's one of the you know the great soundtracks of all time as well. It's the one that has a Pusher Man, if you remember that. You remember that uh, song, Pusher Man? Uh, that one is, you know, a great, great song, all right? And there's other great songs on it as well. The whole the whole album is a great album, and you know uh, soundtracks can be hit and miss. And a lot of soundtracks I wouldn't I won't collect because basically they're just a you know a compilation disc of, of of the director's favorite music, right? And you can get that music off the actual original albums, so it's just like a compilation disc. Um, I mean, there's exceptions like uh, I picked up Pulp Fiction. That's a really good soundtrack, even though it's kind of like a compilation of different films. Tarantino has a good taste in music. Um, and, uh, but some, like, some just outshine the film altogether. And the one that always pops into my mind when it comes to a soundtrack that really outshines the film is that vampire film called The Queen of the Dam. You remember that film, Queen of the Dam? That heavy metal, hard rock heavy metal, uh, soundtrack on that, for that film is just astounding. Uh, but the actual film is 
no, it's not all that great. So, um, so anyway, so this the superfly, and I'm going to come back to this in in a as an example in another video about protecting your 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 uh, your collection. Uh, I just won't tell you why yet. All right. So, so, but it's one of the greats. If you haven't found this film, um, find it and watch it. It's a really good black exploitation film. All right. So that's superfly. Next step after that is a place in the sun. Now, place in, like I said, I usually collect by directors, and this one was directed by George Stevens. Yeah, George Stevens. It came out in 1951. But the main reason why I I uh, got this one was because of Elizabeth Taylor. She's one of my favorite, you know, like 40s, 50s, 60s uh, actresses. Um, and the main reason, main isn't this film. I haven't seen this film yet, all right? But I picked it up because of her. And the reason why I picked it up because of her is because I saw her in a film that was called um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Have you seen that film? All right. If you haven't seen Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, pick it up. If you come across the book, which is a play by Edward Albee, if I remember correctly, um, pick it up and read it. It's 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 not a, a thick book. It's, it's actually, you know, it's a play. It's not very large. Right? But I'm telling you, if you're about to get married, like, I'm glad I did not see this film before I asked my wife to marry me. Um, because it might have turned me off on actually asking my wife to marry me. Um, because if my marriage ends up at the end of my marriage, ends up the way that George and Martha, right? It's George and Martha in, in street, oh, sorry, George and Martha in uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, how they go at each other, all right? Um, my goodness, it's like, a, I mean, if, if, if you're a father and, and you think your daughter is marrying a, a jerk, ever sit down and watch this film, okay? Um, maybe, maybe it'll turn her off on marriage and she won't marry the guy because if a marriage ends up being the way that this one is, oh my goodness, it is, I've never seen two people act and, and insult each other and, and hurt each other and be so nasty towards each other without even raising their voice, just, you know, that kind of thing, um, and without ever, ever raising a hand, you know what I mean? Um, wow, Al Albie, Edward Albie is I would not want to get into a, an intellectual argument or fight of insults with that gentleman because, uh, my goodness, that guy would probably just dance all over my brain, right? So, um, and it's an extremely good play, and it's an extremely good movie, and it, and it stars Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, and Elizabeth Taylor is just astounding in it, and she made me an instant fan because of that film. And I've watched other films since then, like Cleopatra, and I'm going to look forward uh, to this film. I haven't seen it. This this film uh, stars uh, Montgomery Cliff and and Shelley Winters as well. Now Shelley Winters, um, she plays the love interest of of Montgomery Cliff, but she's like a you know working class girl working in a factory that his his father owns, and and he's trying to move up in the world. He doesn't want to because his father put him in the factory as well to you know learn hard work and everything, right? So. But he did, he doesn't want to be there. He wants to be, he wants to be like a rich socialite, and so he ends up uh, meeting Elizabeth Taylor, who is a rich socialite, and they end up getting involved, even though he's involved with Shelley Winters originally, and it ends in tragedy. It's a, like a love triangle that ends ends in tragedy, from my understanding, and uh, it's supposed to be one hell of a a film. Now, isn't it funny? I've always I've always disliked the deception of posters and you know, DVD or Blu-ray cases that show the film, like the poster for the film or whatever, and it's always in color. You ever notice that? It's always in color because it's brighter, and they, it's not, the, the photograph wasn't taken in color. It was colorized after the fact, usually, right? And then they make a poster out of it, and it's a colored poster, because color looks nicer than black and white, but the film is in black and white, so you think that you're going to see a colored film, but the film is in black and white. Um, I'd... I love black and white films just as much as I love color films, but I don't like the, okay, I'm going to watch this, it's a color film, and then it ends up being a black and white film, I'm going, I'm just advertise it as a black and white film, that way I know it's a black and white film, and I can watch it as a black and white film, I'm not surprised, but anyway, that's just a little pet peeve, right? Um, so, it's supposed to be a very good film, all right, so that's A Place in the Sun, all right, so next up is Hello, Dolly, and like I said, I collect uh, I collect films usually through the director, and I'll, I'm going to make a video why I do that. Um, um, but this one, like this one, I didn't collect because of the director. All right, who was the director? Yeah, George Stevens. I 
I, I collected this. Now, this Gene Kelly directed this one, and this one came out. When did this one come out? Uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, Hello Dolly. Uh, all right, I have a note on that. All right, so. So it came out in 1969, okay, and it, it was directed by Gene Kelly, uh, you know, dancer Gene Kelly, famous dancer, singing in the rain, um, an American in Paris, uh, what else did he do, uh, the pirate, all right, um, but this I got because of Barbara Streisand, all right, so I'm a big fan of Barbara Streisand, but for some reason I'm only really a big fan of hers, you know, I, I've seen her regular movies, because um, she does have some. And I've listened to, you know, uh, music by her outside of film, you know, like on, on record or CD. And I don't really have much of her on record or CD, on LP or CD, on vinyl. Nothing, really. But if you come across, if I come across a musical with, with Barbara Streisand in it, I'm picking it up. So this one, you know, Yentl, A Star is Born. Um, what else? Uh, Funny Girl. Funny Girl was uh, was the first film I saw, and that's where I... You know, fell in love with her, her, you know, her quirkiness and her acting and singing ability on on screen, right? So hopefully, Hello Dolly is as good as A Star Is Born because I haven't seen this one yet. Huh? I didn't tell you what it's about. So Walter Matthau of the Odd Couple fame and um, the Bad News Bears plays a kind of like a rich recluse who who uh, uh, Barbara Strand. Barbara Streisand falls in love with, but he's kind of a loop about it. So she does all these uh, manipulations in the film to get his attention and and see if uh, she will he will uh, you know fall in love with her kind of idea because she's kind of in love with him. So that's what the film is about. All right. So next up is School Days, which is a Spike Lee joint because Spike Lee is too cool for school, man. He's an awesome director, and he never. It's not a it's not a Spike Lee film. It's a Spike Lee joint, okay? And all of his films, you know, are trendy, are cool. And what I really, what's really charming that I find about uh, Spike Lee is that he's in a lot of his own films. I mean, he stars in them, but he's not the main star. He's kind of like a side character in the films, and he's really he's really a fun actor to watch. Um, and his films are usually really good. Now. Probably his best mainstream film was a film called, what was that film called? It starred Denzel Washington, and uh, it was about a bank robbery, and Clive Owen was the bank robber. What was the name of that film? Inside Man. All right, so he directed Inside Man, which is probably his most successful mainstream film, and it's it's really fun to watch. I won't ruin the film for you because it's really interesting how they actually do the bank robbery. I've never seen that on film before. Of course, I haven't seen every film, so maybe they, you know, uh, got it from another film that I haven't seen. But if it was an original idea, uh, extremely good way to rob a bank, right? And uh, anyway, so he's done a bunch of good films. Um, probably his best film, like not his most successful or best film, is probably Do the Right Thing. And uh, I have four or five of his films in, in, in my library, but I haven't watched a lot of them since they came out back in the 80s and the 90s, right? Um, but I have I have not seen this one. I have not seen School Days. And one of the other attractions of, of, of him being in it also is, if you're a fan of uh, Breaking Bad, uh, one of the main characters in Breaking Bad, you know, the bad guy, uh, what was his name? Well, Lawrence Fishburne is in this as well, you know, um, and Spike Lee plays Half Pint, all right. Um, but where's the guy? You know, the, the Spanish guy. Where's the Spanish guy? I'm wasting your time here. I'm wasting your time. <laughs> Crap, I can't remember his name. Anyways, he plays, uh, you know, the main bad guy in in, uh, in Breaking Bad that, uh, that Cranston ends up having to, uh, you know, he builds Cranston, uh, you know, a meth lab and everything. What was his name? Anyways, he's, he stars in this one as as a more uptight guy. Anyways, um, it's supposed to be a really good film, but I haven't seen it yet. So that's uh, School Days. I collected that one because of the director. So, and then this one is on Reputation. I collected this film not because of the director, because of the re Reputation. Now, the director is 
Richard Rush, and I don't have any other of his films, and I don't know if any of other of his films are great or not, but this one has a really good reputation. It's supposed to be a really fun 70s film. Was it 70s, 1970? When did this come out? Yeah, it came out in 1980. All right. And it stars Peter O'Toole and... The main guy is Steve Railsback. All right, now Steve Railsback, is that how you pronounce his name? You should know him if you watch 80s films, 80s films after this. Um, so this one came out in 80, but there was a, a, like a space vampire movie that came out around 1985. Uh, he played in that, he was one of the main characters, and that was an amazing film, I really liked that film. That was called uh, Life Force, you ever see that? Now, now the, you know, the uh, special effects in it are kind of dated now, but it still looks cool the way that the, they suck the soul, the vampires suck the souls out of human beings. Um, it's pretty cool to watch even now. And that, I really like that film. And this film is supposed to be extremely good. It has a really good reputation as, as, as a fun, exciting film. Um, and the reason why is because Peter O'Toole plays a film director who's filming a film during this film, okay? And, uh, What's his name? Rails back uh, plays a criminal who's escaped from prison or escaped from police custody, and the police are after him. And he ends up stumbling upon Peter O'Toole's uh, a set, and he accidentally kills the—I think it's accidentally kills the stuntman on the set. So Peter O'Toole says, "I'm going to turn you in, or you become my stuntman." And Peter to Peter O'Toole has a you know a, a reason for that, and the reason is, well, his other stuntman, maybe he wouldn't be able to do some such outrageous stunts because you know fear of killing the guy but he doesn't fear about killing uh, this new stunt man who's a criminal running from the police because he's a criminal running from the police right so he puts him through uh all these freaking outrageous uh you know uh, stunts and um, it's like he's trying to kill the guy right so i mean he's like flying off of airplanes and, and, and other things uh like I said, I haven't seen the film yet, so but so, supposedly some of the stunts in there are pretty pretty wicked. So, um, so it's supposed to be an interesting film as well. Oh, uh, Rel, maybe you saw Rel because in, when he was in the '80s, I can't remember was it the '70s or the '80s. He starred as uh, uh, Charles Manson in, in Helter Skelter. If you remember that TV miniseries? It was called Helter Skelter. He played Charles Manson in that. If you saw that, and that one uh, is is a good. Uh, if you come across that uh, miniseries, pick it up. It's really good as well. But I think, don't quote me on it, but because it's called Helter Skelter, I would assume it was based on the, the Victor Bugliosi film, uh, uh, film book. Uh, Bugliosi was the guy that, that put away the Manson family, put away, uh, uh, he was the lawyer that put away Charles Manson. Um, he's, he, he was the lawyer that convinced the jury that although Manson was never at any of the murders, or participated in any of the murders that he was the leader of, of you know, of, of that group that was out in, in Death Valley, living out in Death Valley. He was the leader of that group and he did un, undue influence over, over the other, uh, you know, brainwashed them and made them uh, murder like the, uh, you know, the Folger family and Sharon Tate and all those, all, all those murders, right? So, um, so he actually had Manson convicted without Manson ever lifting a finger in any of those murders, right? So so he's quite the lawyer. And then, anyways, he, he wrote he wrote a got to be like a thousand page uh, true crime book about the the story, the capture and and, and, and the trial and everything of of uh, Manson and Iggy Fromm and all the, all the other members of the Manson family and it's an engrossing read. If you come across it, you should pick it up and read it because, um, personally speaking, I think it's the greatest true crime novel ever written. Um, well, maybe, yeah, I, I think I enjoyed it more than uh, than Truman Compote's, what was that one called? One was pretty good. Uh, Cold In Cold Blood. That was kind of more of like a novel. It was written in novel form rather than in, in you know, in a... Uh, the usual true crime way and you know there's another film uh, another anyways I'm, I'm 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 digressing anyway so so uh i keep forgetting his name right back started charles manson in that miniseries 
I'm assuming based on the Bugliosi uh, True Crime book. All right, so that's The Stuntman. It's supposed to be really good if you haven't seen it. Uh, if you find it, watch it. Let me know what you think. And if you have seen it, is it a really good film? Like I'm thinking it's going to be a fun film, or am I incorrect? All right, so next up after that is The Cat's Meow. And this I picked up because of the director. And the director is Peter Bogdanovich because he directed two films that I really enjoyed. And I thought maybe because I enjoyed those films that I would enjoy this one. This one stars Kirsten Dunst of uh, Bring It On fame. Remember that uh, uh, cheerleading movie? It gives you a whole new look on cheerleading. You don't think it's just a whole bunch of girls with boobs bouncing and, and pom-poms bouncing around. That's the the uh, you know the entirety of their talent. No, I mean, they have, have their competitions and it's like gymnastics up the yu yang. And it, it's an extremely entertaining film, all right? And... Uh, uh, she also, you know, is famous for that uh, Spider-Man kiss with uh, Tobey Maguire, the upside-down kiss with, with Spider-Man. Um, she was uh, also in the uh, 2002 Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Um, all right, so uh, this film, Bogdanovich directed it. It's it's about a group of socialites going out on a, on a rich guy's yacht out into the uh, the ocean to have a party, and one of them ends up dead. And when they come back, you know, to land. Uh, I think it's based on a true story, and that murder, if it was a murder, was never solved. So, and they don't know exactly. Anyway, so uh, Bogdanovich uses his, you know, artistic license to create a film around it. And, you know, uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin happened to be one of the guys on, on, on the boat, so that's kind of interesting. Um, I think it was the Hearst, Hearst family boat. Uh, and anyway, so, uh, but I got it because of Peter Bogdanovich, who directed. What did he direct? He directed he Cats Meow, uh, one of the the Last Picture Show. So that was the first film, 1971, The Last Picture Show, starring um, uh, God, what, what was her name? Sybil Shepherd. Remember Sybil Shepherd from the 80s? Uh, with Bruce Willis doing uh, the TV show Moonlighting. Well, before she did Moonlighting, she was in this film by Bogdanovich back in 71 as a teenager, and there's a, like a famous scene of her. Uh, you know, uh, attending a teenage uh, party. It's it's like a, a new beach, uh, sorry, new new pool party. And there's a, you know, there's the famous scene of her on the uh, on the diving board uh, taking her clothes off or whatever. Right? Also stars Jeff Bridges and a few others. Uh, uh, Cloris Leachman, which is one of the side ones. She is really good in that film, actually. I mean, I think she actually steals the show, Cloris Leachman, in that film. Anyway, so uh, it's a really good film if you haven't seen it. It's actually from 71, but it's not in color. It's a black and white film. And that was this is the film that I, that I said earlier in, in the video that I was going to mention about black and white. Unless Black and white films are great, um, but color is better. Unless the, the director on purpose uses black and white as, as a part of, of, of what he's pre presenting you. And it would be presented better if it was in black and white rather than in color. Now this this film takes place, I think, in 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 the in the 30s, during or just after, you know, the uh, the Great Depression, and so I I guess Bogdanovich, I think Bogdanovich did it in black and white to give it that feel, because if he did it in color, it wouldn't feel like it was like the 1920s or the 1930s. I think I think it was that that was the reason. I would have to research that, but I think if I remember correctly, that was the reason. Um, anyways, if, if I'm wrong, just leave a comment below and, and correct me. Um, and so, so it's an extremely good film. So I'm figuring that this film is going to be pretty good as well, because he also did in 1985, he did a, a film called Mask, which is about, uh, you know, share shares in it. And, uh, uh, what was his name? The guy from Roadhouse, Sam Elliott was in it. Um, and, uh, He's the boyfriend of Cher, and Cher have, has a son, you know, a teenage son who's who has a lionism. I'm not sure of the technical uh, term for the disease, but it basically hardens your bones and makes them grow, and they don't stop growing. And it makes your face look like you have the face of a lion, you know, similar to the face of the lion in The Wizard of Oz, right, when you see it. Um, and Eric Stoltz plays the, the son, and he does an extremely good job. And uh, But he looks like he has a lion face. And basically, it's it's... It's a sad film. It's one of the sadder films that I've ever seen. Um, and and But Cher does a really good job. I think she won an Oscar for that film. I'm not a huge Cher fan, but you know I liked her in Moonstruck. I liked her in this film and, and a few others. Um, 
and Eric Stoltz does a does a really good job in that film. And you know, Sam Elliott is his uh, you know heartthrob to women uh, best in it because they're all bikers or whatever. So so anyway, so that's a really good film. So Mask and and, and the Last Picture Show made me a Bogdanovich fan, and this had Bogdanovich on it, so I picked it up and I'll, I'll end up watching it. All right, next up is uh, Casino Royale. Sorry, David Niven as as James Bond. This is the first James Bond film, but it was kind of like not. I mean, there was a bit of humor, you know, lightheartedness in most of the Bond films until you come up to the Daniel Craig James Bond. I mean, you know, with Roger Moore and Sean Connery, there's always that lighthearted uh, joy to to uh, Bond films. Like you're not supposed to take them too seriously, but this one is like really that way. It stars Niven as as a retired James Bond who comes out of retirement. Now I haven't seen the film, okay. But it's one of the few I, I I picked up that collection, you know, the 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 complete collection of the Eon films on Blu-ray. It comes in a white package. And I picked that up. So so I have every one of the Bond films except for the two non-Eon, and this was one of them. And the other one is the 1983 film that stars Sean Connery as James Bond. While in the Eon films, you know, uh, uh, Roger Moore was James Bond by that time. And, the film that came out at that time, I think, was Octopussy. Octopussy came out at that time. And so you had Octopussy and you had a... I can't remember the name of the Connery film. Uh, Never Say Never Again, I think. Never Say Never Again, but don't quote me on it. So, um, and it was... Both of the films were, were, were very good for, for Bond films. But this one is the first ever Bond film. It's not an Eon film. Eon is the one that directed all the Bond films except for the two that I just mentioned. This is one of them. So this is more of a comedy rather than... And and it has the same storyline as the Casino Royale film with uh, with Daniel Craig in it, but it's more light. You know, I mean, when you have, you know, Peter Sellers stars in it as well, and Woody Allen stars, it, stars in it as well, you know that it's going to be a comedy because both of those guys are kind of geniuses, right? So it's supposed to be a really fun film, and, and it's the first James Bond film based on the first novel... Uh, by Ian Fleming, which was the same name, Casino Royale. So I'm, I'm assuming this is a pretty good film. I know I've seen it before, uh, back in the 70s when I was younger. Um, uh, I think it came out in 69, if I remember correctly, six, no, 67. And the film by uh, the other uh, non-Eon film uh, was called Never Say Never Again. It came out in 1983. All right, so, um, and this one, this one was also, the reason why I picked it up, because I didn't have it, one of the few Bond films I don't have, was also directed by John Huston, right? And John Huston is one of the huge names in, 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 in you know, uh, uh, Hollywood cinema. Um, I don't really need to explain who John Huston is, well. Anyway, so, so this is one of his films as well. So it's got to be a good film, right? All right, so next up is Fear Strikes Out, and this one is directed by Robert Mulligan. And Robert Mulligan is the guy, if I remember correctly, did... Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird. Did he do To Kill a Mockingbird? I think so. I know I wrote it down. Um, and he did a, a To Kill a Mockingbird after this film. This film came out in, in the 50s. All right. So, yeah, 1956. And it stars Anthony Perkins of Psycho fame. And he plays a, a Parasol? Parasol. Yeah, Jim, Jimmy Parasol, if that's how you pronounce Jimmy Parasol's name. Who was a you know he was a very good player for the Boston Red Sox back in that day, and and so I picked it up because of the director. I picked it up because you know I'm, I'm a fan. I, I'd like to see uh, what uh, what Anthony Perkin, Perkins did when he wasn't being a psycho guy that dressed up as a mother's clothes and killed people with a knife. Um, see what he's like as a baseball player. And I'm a big fan of baseball movies because you know I'm a big fan of baseball. It's my favorite sport. Yes, I'm in Canada, but um. Hockey is not my favorite sport. Baseball is, um, and I have a you know, whenever I find a baseball movie, I'll usually pick it up and watch it. So I have a good amount of them, you know, all the all the main baseball films like Field of Dreams or, or or Bull Durham or Eight Men Out or you know all these all these uh, films about baseball I really enjoy, and I'm assuming I'll enjoy this one as well. This one is about Carousel who had an overbearing father, you know, one of those parents you'll see at well here in Canada, hockey is is like is like religion, right? So, so when when uh, parents put their kids in hockey, they'll spend thousands of dollars on equipment and training and everything else, and they'll put them in hockey, and it's like a huge deal. They think that 
every parent thinks that their uh, their son will be the next Wayne Gretzky and and enter the NHL when like you know less than one tenth of a percent of all play, people that play hockey as as boys will end up in the NHL, right? So, um, so you know they're very overbearing. They're very oh they'll get mad at coaches if they don't play their uh, son enough or if their son isn't doing well they'll chastise his son and, and that's what this is about is about a, a guy a father who who uh suffered suffered nothing when it came to his son's uh, baseball education and and pushed him and it pushed him so hard that he ended up becoming mentally ill and it was about him um overcoming his mental illness in order to get into the uh uh, into Major League Baseball, right? So it's supposed to be a pretty good, it's like a cautionary tale for parents who just go crazy over their kids, right? So uh, next up is Never on Sunday. And this film is directed by, what was his name? He's one of the big names in, in early cinema. Now this was from 1960. Uh, it was directed by Jules Dassin. Dassin, the same, ignorant intellectual. Me being Canadian and when I looked at his name, it sounds French, so I want to say Jules Dassin, right? So, um, but it's probably Jules Dassin. Um, and the film uh, is from 1960, and by that time, uh, Dassin had left the United States. He's an American director. He left the United States to go to Europe because he was blacklisted by M McCarthy during the McCarthy era, where, I mean, he... If you had a sprinkle of communism anywhere near you, you were blacklisted if you were in the arts. And so he couldn't direct films in, in the United States anymore, so he left. And he uh, uh, went over to Europe and directed films in Europe. And um, he's another big director, that the guy that I bought all those like those 2,000 films off of. He has a lot of uh, Dassin, Dassin's um, works. But... Uh, there's two main ones. One, one's in the Criterion Collection. One's on the left. Let me look here. Um, it was a film noir back in the 40s. If I remember correctly, what was it called? Oh yeah, Thieves Highway. All right. So, so Dassin was another big name in 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 uh, in film noir, and he did two film noir films. Of, well, one of them, Thieves Highway, is one of the greats of all time, and, and that you can find in the Criterion Collection if you know what that is. And Night and the City is the other one from 1950. So Thieves on the Highway is from 1949. So those two black uh, film noir films are two of the, up there as two of the greatest film noirs. And he did this one in 1960. And I think it was in Greece at the time. When he went over to Europe, I think he, he went to France. But here he's in Greece in 1960. And this stars uh, Melina McCoury. And she plays um, like a hooker. Uh, but a hooker that, like, more like a call girl, not a street hooker, if I remember correctly, uh, from, from uh, you know, the word of mouth of this film is very good. Um, and and she, she enjoys her life. She's always having a good time. And she comes uh, across an American who's Jules Desain as well. So Jules Desain is, is stars in his, his own film, um, who's like an uptight American, uh, you know, like anal retentive type of guy. Um, and they kind of, they meet, and one tries to influence the other to get out of prostitution, and the other one tries to influence the other to stop being such a, you know, a, a stick in the mud or whatever, and, and enjoy his life, right? So so they kind of rub off on each other, and, and, and it's supposed to be a very good film. I'm not sure what the conclusion of it is, um, but if it's Dassin directing it, Another another one that looks like it's a color film, but it's an actual black and white film, even though it's in the 1960s, right? It's not a color film; it's a black and white film. You can see right there, black and white. So, um, so that's supposed to be a very good film as well. All right. And last but not least, least, and you know what? I'm going to save this film, Old Man in the Sea, until my next video, because I'm just going to do. Uh, these ones, I'm gonna add this to the other ones, to the to the to the box sets I got. I'm gonna uh, make a part two, all right, to this uh, this film, uh, this video, and uh, I'll add the uh, the two Blu-rays that I got as well to the, the second part of this film. So I'll end this film here with the 16 regular uh, DVDs that I got off the gentleman's library of like 
500 to 1,000 films, I think you had listed. Well, when you have a lot of films, uh, when you're searching for films that you haven't seen yet, it's like a needle in a haystack. So if you can think of 1,000 films, and through the 1,000 films, I can only find 16 that I that are either aren't in my collection or I, uh, I want to watch, right, that aren't in my collection. You'll have other films I don't have in my collection, but I've seen them, I don't like them, or, or I have no interest in them kind of thing. So I could only find 16 out of almost 1,000 films. That's uh, how difficult it is to find films that you don't have. Um, sometimes after you, your collection becomes large, right? So, um, it's, it's a nice thing. It's a, it's, it's a nice problem to have though, right? Okay. So, so this is part one of, of, of me, uh, collecting the films uh, from that gentleman's library that he put up on, uh, Facebook marketplace. And afterwards we're going to do, uh, in, in part two, we're going to, there's a reason why I'll tell you in part two, why I held on to this film, the old man in the sea. Um, we're going to do the two Blu-rays that I got uh, from him, and the one, two, three, four uh, box sets that I got off of him. Okay, all right. So, so we'll stop it there. And I, I, I really appreciate you uh, uh, watching this channel. I really appreciate you uh, that you've come to this film. Uh, film. I keep calling it a film. It's not a film. It's a video. Um, you've come to this video and. Uh, and hopefully you've enjoyed it, and maybe you'll stick around for part two. Maybe you'll watch part two. Um, and if you enjoyed it, leave a thumbs up in the uh, in the you know description below, and, and maybe join the channel if if you're so inclined to. I'll have more videos like this one, but you know other videos about collecting. Uh, I'll show off my collection and parts, um, whether it's book or or CD or vinyl or or you know movies. Um, I'll just go through it and make more videos and, and it should be enjoyable. Hopefully as enjoyable as this one. I had, I had fun doing this um, a video and hopefully you enjoyed watching it and hopefully I'll see you in the part two and other videos that will be coming. And uh, thank you for watching and uh, I'll talk to you again and bye for now.